One of the first conditions of happiness is that the link between man and nature shall not be broken. Carrying the same vision, Symbiosis Biodiversity Family is here again with our Sunday special session. A very good afternoon to all. I, Nishtha Chandak, extend my heartiest welcome to all the participants on behalf of my SIU Biodiversity Cell. Today, we have with us a marine biologist, Ms. Zoya Tyabji. We welcome you, Zoya, ma'am. With a fascination for all things marine, she has worked on various projects, including sea crates, coral reefs, fisheries, and education and outreach. Her interests lie in interactions of fish and humans, and she is currently studying the shark and ray fisheries of India for her PhD. We are so glad to have you with us today. Before we start, I wish all of you a very happy Teacher's Day. Over to you, Zoya, ma'am. So yeah, any uh, problem at your end? Need any help? Sorry, my internet just froze. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's fine. I thought yeah. no, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for this, uh, for attending this session. Uh, thank you Shilpa ma'am for inviting me here. And thank you to the organizers, for, to Simbas's Biodiversity Cell and the family for having this. So my uh, journey actually started with a similar, uh, a very influential, uh, with a teacher who was very influential for me and she really guided me uh, in this. So, um, yeah, it's an incredible feat that you've uh, achieved and especially with the one year because the last year has been really difficult. So thank you so much for this. Uh, I'm going to uh, just share my screen and I'm going to switch off my uh, video if that's okay because of the internet issues. Yes. So uh, I'm not being able to go to the next slide. Yes, okay, sorry. Uh, so it was only fitting that I start off with JAWS as it's something that has influenced all of us either to have a fascination with sharks or to fear them. But I wanted to show all of you another side to sharks, which is not all about being bloodthirsty, and I'm hoping that by the end of it, you know that there is more to sharks than just jaws. Um, I have, uh, so the entire presentation is, uh, there are a little technical aspects to introduce you to uh, sharks and rays, but at the end of it, I'm just, I just really wanna introduce everyone to um, the uh, aspects of shark fisheries in India and about the complexities of managing such a fishery. So the fossil records of sharks, of sharks have been dated back to 400 million years, whereas for rays and skates date back to approximately 150 million years ago during the lower Jurassic. Uh, in contrast to bony fish and skates, they leave behind very little fossil records with the exception of teeth and scales because their entire uh, skeleton is made up of cartilage and not bone. So they belong to the class chondrichthys 
and uh, because of the cartilaginous nature of their skeleton. And so the cartilage is, so if you touch your nose and ears, they are not, they are a little flexible. So it's not, they are not made up of bone, but they are made up of cartilage. The advantage of having cartilage is that it's more flexible, more durable, and it's half the density of bone. So they actually have an advantage. Now the subclass is divided of elasmobranchs, uh, uh, sorry, chondrichthyns are divided into two, holocephali, which are chimeras and go sharks. So holocephali, if anyone's seen uh, the documentary Planet Earth, this is the creature they mentioned in the deep sea episode. So holocephali means complete head and very little is known really about these primitive forms. So they move by using these sweeping movements of their large pectoral fins and they have long slender tails. They live very close to the seabed and move on, feed on benthic invertebrates. They lack a stomach, so food moves directly into the intestine. So it is truly a primitive form. Now the second class of uh, subclass of elasmo, uh, uh, subclass of chondrichthyns is elasmobranchs. So members of elasmobranch subclass have, they are divided into two, selachimorpha and batoidia. So selachimorpha are your sharks, whereas batoidia contain of, uh, consist of rays, skates, uh, and we'll be seeing a lot more about that too. Uh, so what makes, uh, what makes elasmobranchs different from bony fish are the presence of, uh, first of all, the uh, uh, no, uh, so bony fish have air filled or gas filled swim bladders. So that helps it float and that helps it uh, maintain its buoyancy. But elasmobranchs don't have any such swim bladders or like glands. Instead, they have a liver which is full of fat and that is responsible for the buoyancy. They also consist of five to seven pairs of gill openings, in the, which individually open up to the exterior, and dermal denticles, which, so these denticles decrease drag and turbulence and allow the shark to swim faster and more quietly. So all these features differentiate them from bony fish. Bony fish are also called telios. Now, the subclass consists of sharks, rays, and scales. One of the most characteristic identification features to differentiate with, differentiate sharks from rays and scales is the location of the gill slits. So now if you look at sharks, it's present on the lateral side of the animal or the side. Whereas in rays and scales, it's present, you can't see them over here because it's present on the underside of the animal. So it's present right next to its mouth. And the major difference between rays and scales uh, apart from morphological features is that rays are, uh, it's actually the reproductive strategy. So rays are live pairing or viviparous, whereas skates are egg laying or oviparous. And their egg laying, the eggs are not, um, they're not, uh, you know, like the normal eggs, like a chicken or like a bird's eggs that we usually identify eggs with. They are actually enveloped in a really thick case called as a moment purse. So I have the image in uh, the next few slides. So uh, does anyone, can anyone identify whether like these are sharks or rays? Uh, I think it's shark. Downu uh, ala to shark, I think. Okay. Uh, maybe you can have a few people uh, write it in the comments section. Yes, people, you can uh, write in the comment section what you think. So I'll give it one more minute. Okay, so the species above is actually a shark. It's oh. called a saw shark because it's got the, you can see the uh, gill slits, but the species below what we usually call a sawfish is actually a ray species. 
and mm-hmm. because you don't see the gil uh, the gills over here they are on the underside so they are very similar but uh, this is this actually belongs to a completely other subclass than this uh so this is the saw shark is not found in india but the saw fish are found in india and they are very critically endangered so yeah so today sharks have evolved into more than 500 species that come in all different sizes colors have varying diet and behavior they've adapted themselves to various roles in the ecosystem so they've also in they in also inhabit different niches from freshwater to marine ecosystem um i think majority of us probably would know about the species but most of us but those of us who don't so if you think you're scared of sharks meet the whale shark they they are the largest fish species on earth which can grow up to 18 meters and they don't have the gnarly teeth that is probably associated unfortunately with sharks but instead they filter feed so which is they have sieve like teeth that they sieve water from the plankton now whale sharks were once known to be fished along the shores of the indian state of gujarat and they have also been known to use the state of gujarat as a pumping ground uh today after a lot of effort more than i think 20 years by the wildlife trust of india this organization they had regular campaigns to spread awareness among the local coastal communities and that has led to a successful conservation of the species there where they don't uh, so earlier they used to uh, kill shibel sharks because of their meat and the uh, liver but uh, and also their fins but because of the conservation efforts um, that has now stopped uh, however that said there was a recent episode i think just before the lockdown and even during the lockdown where they found a, a individual without its fins so conservation of any of anything is an ongoing long term process unfortunately so it, you need continuous interactions with fishers and continuous change of uh, Uh, regulations to actually lead to life conservation but this species also was the first to be added to the indian wildlife protection act 1972 and it was added in 2001 but till then the indian wildlife protection ha- act has been very terrestrial centric and unfortunately it continues to be that today but we still don't know a lot of this species so there was a recent scientific publication which said that uh, the eyes of the whale shark actually have are made up of and have consist of teeth uh, so the diversity of sharks range from the largest to the smallest sharks in the world this is the dwarf lantern shark which is not found in india but it's pretty fascinating as the maximum known length of the shark is 20 cm so this species of shark actually glows in the shark uh, in the dark as it's capable of producing light from the light producing cells called photophores this is the most ancient species called the greenland shark through radiocarbon dating of crystals within the lens of the eye they found that the older shark sampled or studied by this method was actually had actually lived for 500 years already and that's pretty ancient and this is an apex predator but it's restricted to living in temperate or cold waters now mako sharks these are definitely found in india um, so there is the long fin mako shark and a short fin mako shark so the pectoral fins are so this is a short fin mako shark as the name suggests long fins have like much longer pectoral fin now if you see the body the uh, the different sharks have uh, it you see the uh, tail of the shark so this is a homo sophil tail and it's also uh, called a mackerel shark this is the fastest uh, shark in the world and that is mostly because this the tail is in the shape of a mackerel and so it helps allows it to have like great speeds uh now if you look if you find fishers mostly use the indicators of swordfish um uh, so if basically if you have a good population of swordfish in the area they are good indicators of the shortfin mako populations because these feed on them 
this species also show counter shading that is it's dark above and light below and this is the basis of camouflage for these predators in the water so because if you look at it from below uh, because of the sun and the water you will uh, this counter shading actually helps um, the white actually helps it merge from the water and that applies to like both sides and so this species is mostly pelagic in nature so it stays in the open ocean but it occasionally comes closer to the shore and especially around island systems unfortunately their numbers have plummeted due to fishing for their meat and fin and since they are migratory species they are listed on international regulations such as a uh, convention for migratory species and cites which is convention on international trade in endangered species uh the thresher shark uh this is one really cool species uh i think it's probably one of my favorites too so there are three species again the pelagic common and big eye and all of them are found in india the really interesting part about the shark species is that they are active predators which means that they use their really long tails uh it, it the tail is used as a weapon to stun prey so it lashes its tail and hits a fish which and stuns it and then it moves in to uh, forage on the species now unfortunately due to their appearance they're also a target of many recreational fisheries and they're also threatened due to the high demand for the meat liver and fins for shark fin soup uh before i started studying sharks and rays i'd always heard that if sharks stop moving they will die as they probably can't take in oxygen into their gills well this is not entirely true the majority of species use this method for buccal pumping so if you see if you see these spiracles they're actually uh, they're actually use their cheek muscles to physically filter water into their mouths and over their gills and the spiracles help them in doing that. so they can also alternate between periods of activity and rest but about two dozen shark species which we've seen earlier like the whale shark mako shark the great white shark they are obligate ram ventilators so wherein it's essential for them to keep moving to stay alive so this is because the they pass water through their open mouths and over the gills while in constant swimming motion but some sharks like the sand tiger sharks however can alternate between these methods so this is a, a this is a, a zebra or a leopard shark and uh, so even the reproduction is quite varied in sharks where some of them have uh, ovo sorry oviparity whereas the shark deposits eggs in the ocean which will hatch later so there's no parental care Uh, so these are what are called as mermaid purses so these are the long tendrils of the mermaid so the shark so the eggs actually wrap around on a substrate or like a seaweed or algae part and this helps them stay on the substrate sharks also show viviparity which is they give birth to live young and ovvv parrots which means that they the eggs hatch and the babies develop inside the female's body but there is no placenta to nourish the pups uh, similarly there are uh, a huge diversity of rays too so these are the sawfish that we saw and these are the torpedo rays the guitar fish there are electric rays and they again they are really diverse in their feeding habits so if you look at morbilla and mantas they they again have um a sieve like a uh, feeding apparatus like the whale shark whereas the eagle rays and the cow nose rays have these mouth structures that uh, they also have a lot of uh, they also have crushing teeth because they feed on mollusks and that's shells and other uh, invertebrates with hard shells so sharks have adopt, uh, adapted to occupying different depths habitats and niches too and um this is the same for rays too and so but what is the importance of sharks and rays so you know we've learned from the beginning that sharks are have a play a really important and integral part in structuring fish communities but 
where they uh, balance food webs, they keep prey populations healthy, and they keep vital. Uh, they sorry, they help in keeping vital habitats healthy. So, just to give you an example, uh, in India, there was a study that was done, um, carried out in. It was a global study uh, in different parts of the world, and the India component was in the Lakshadweep Islands. Uh, and what they saw over there was they studied the um, populations of uh, tiger sharks and um, sea turtles uh, in all these areas. And they found so sea turtles are also quite uh, endangered, like they are also threatened, sorry. Uh, but what they found was because of the overfishing of sharks in Lakshadweep, this had allowed the population, because the sharks would usually keep the total populations in check. Uh, but because of the overfishing of sharks, sea turtles had become, sea turtle population had increased and they were overgrazing the seagrass system. And in fact, this also led to like the reduction of habitat for other species that lived here. Uh, and in turn, this caused a, a fisher a turtle conflict with uh, sorry the fishers had a huge conflict with the turtles because of that because they blamed the turtles for um, uh, for the loss in their livelihoods with fishing uh, but uh, another um, thing is you know like so i started my journey into the marine ecosystem studying coral reef and we all learn about how important sharks are apex predators and how they are so important to the ecosystem. But considering that the entire diversity of sharks that I've shown you, so sharks are, of course, they are apex predators, but that's only true for a few shark species. Sharks are also filter feeders like the gentle giants, the whale shark, or major predators, where they're in the middle of the food web. So they, are prey, they get preyed upon by other sharks or by other uh, fish also. And they're also predatory. So they're kind of in the middle. And there was a recent publication where they also found a herbivorous shark. They're the, one of the species, I think the bonnet head, hammerhead shark feeds on seagrass, which is pretty cool. So this actually makes you think about like how the entire system is changing. And that, you know, we still need to question textbook theory. Um, but while we've spoken a lot about sharks, what is the importance of rays? So rays also help in bioturbulation, which is so if you look at farming, for example, um, uh, farmers have to kind of uh, tilt the soil for aeration. So similarly, rays also help in doing that in uh, which makes like the uh, uh, which allows other substrates to actually grow uh, they also help in energy and nutrient transfers between habitats and both sharks and rays also uh, play a really important role in the economy of uh, economy of the system so whereas they are food for either in the form of like fisheries where you know they are really important uh, livelihood components for the coastal communities, or they play a really huge role in tourism. But despite their evolutionary success and adaptations in life forms, and also being uh, placed in also um, adapting to dif different niches and habitats geographically, today they are one of the most threatened fish worldwide due to the high demand for their fins, meat, and liver oil. And this coupled with the fact that most large to medium sized sharks show slow growth, late maturation and produced few young, they are most vulnerable and driven to the brim of extinction. So if these top predators go locally extinct, they will cause a cascading effect from fish to human. Now India is ranked as the third largest shark and whale harvester of the world, with where Sharks and whales are mostly caught as bycatch, which is that they are not the target of uh, not the target uh, catch for the fishers. But there are a few targeted shark fisheries also existing in the world. Uh, Uh, 
think my case, my mindset is what's happening to the Zoya, you need to check your um, internet again. It's lagging. Just for last uh, few seconds, uh, we could not hear what you said. Okay, just give her a few seconds. She will uh, join us again. Be here. Hello. Sorry, I'm so sorry for this. It's okay. Now we can hear you. Uh, sorry, you'll have to uh, make it. I just did. I just did. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so did you lose me for too long? Uh, no, just uh, when you showed uh, the map of India for that few seconds. Yes, here what you said we lost. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yes, so, uh, so just to reiterate, so uh, India is the third largest shark and ray harvest of the world. Uh, and sharks and rays are mostly caught as uh, a bite in a bycatch fishery, which means that uh, they are not the target fish for the fishers. Uh, however, the even the terms target the bycatch fishery. So earlier, uh, uh, there were only certain fish that were caught, but now even a bycatch uh, fish are now all being retained because of the loss of like the fisheries and the economy. In India itself, there has been a 20% decline observed in the total fish landings in the last 20 to 30 years. And with this, many fishers have informed us that they now have to fish in deeper and far off areas as fish has dramatically decreased near the coast in the past decade or so. So just to put things in perspective, there are a few legislations in place too. So what happened is from the 1980s onwards, a targeted shark fishery started developing to supply to the export market. So, so just to break it down, there, there was uh, sharks and rays used to be caught in very few areas in India where the local communities would, uh, uh, would consume them for the meat. However, this was not large scale and uh, fishers normally uh, preferred bony fish over these cartilaginous fish. But in 1980s, uh, there was a lot of shark fin demand, shark fin demand for soup from Southeast Asia. And in order to feed this, uh, the shark fin, uh, there was a lot of targeted fishery that was developed um, and many places across India to supply to the export market. However, years after the increased demand of shark finning, a practice where fishermen cut the fins of the shark and threw the live body overboard to cut profit losses, the Ministry of Environment and Forest placed a blanket ban on sharks, which meant that all shark and race species could not be caught. However, I mentioned the diversity of and race to you. So it was just not possible for you know fishers to choose because they also have a non-selective gear fishery. So if they put their gear in the water, they can't choose which species can uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you. No, sorry, I just got my internet is unstable notification i'm so sorry for this so uh, yeah so uh, because of this uh, 
there was a huge revolt from the fishermen and the ban was lifted only after six months with 10 species of shark fisheries added to the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, there was also a in 2013, there was a fin attached policy, which meant that sharks had to be uh, landed whole. There was a, in 2015, there was a ruling on export of all shark fins. So fins, uh, so export of fin shark fins was completely banned. Um, and apart from these, there are a few other regulations like the seasonal 45 day shark, uh, sorry, seasonal 45 day fishing bans in the east and west coast of India. And there are international regulations like CITES and CMS, which kind of regulate the international trade in endangered species and the conservation of migratory species. However, there are a lot of the focus has mostly been on um, uh, sharks and not rays, despite them being one of the most threatened species. And it's also um, interesting to see how these regulations were impl implemented because the Wildlife Protection Act is a very terrestrial centric act. So it does not really, uh, uh, it does, it's not as effective for marine species, especially because even with 10 species of sharks and rays added, you can't regulate what species you get. Like on, a, on land, you, if you see a tiger, you can you know, choose whether you wanna hunt it or not. But the same is not true for the water. So while these fish, the, while the fishing sector in, increases and continues to expand, the implementation of existing fisheries regulations is minimal, and indications that shark stocks are impacted by these fisheries are rising. So yet there is limited monitoring of shark landings. Added to that, we still lack some very basic information of what shark species are found here, what their life history characteristics stock structure, geo selectivity, and all of these contribute to knowing about the sustainability of shark fishing. So the big question arises, are we really constructing efficient conservation strategies and management plans? And with this in mind, we decided to assess the status of elasmogranite, which are sharks and rays in the Andaman Islands in India. So when everyone asks, if anyone asks me what I do, I tell them I work on sharks and rays and their fisheries. But what exactly does this mean? So my friends think it's a very glamorous job where I'm swimming with sharks in clear waters. Uh, on the other hand, my family specified that I work on sharks as movies like Jaws, Meg, and 47 Feet Down have unfortunately really caused a fear towards these animals. But what I actually do is this. My study is located in the Andaman Islands in India. So when I first started to study sharks, I went in with a very naive notion that I had just I just had to study the species to protect it, you know. But this is what I so this is what I first did. So I tried to understand the catch composition. So what sharks are present in the animals, their uh, biology, and how they interact with fishing gears and their life history characteristics. So what I did at the landing site is I visited the fish landing site every day for a year and sampled all the sharks that were landed at the fish landing sites by the fishers. Um, now sharks are photo documented to identify to the species level. So how does one identify sharks? So uh, it's actually a lot like bird watching where it's a pro process of deduction by looking for cues and characteristics. So it's a combination of looking at markings, any char characteristic stripes or spots, just like in birds, but don't always go for markings, combine them with characteristics such as the snout shape, the uh, position of the dorsal fin to, in comparison to the pectoral fin, the position of the anal fin and the dorsal fin. So over here, you can see there's a colored mark and the uh, there are also a couple of other features and you combine all of them to determine what uh, what shark species it is. So I also, I also collected information on the total length um, and this is a very good identification guide. So it's for the Arabian seas, but it's very good for the East Coast too as they have a lot of um, similar shark species and it's a very nice introduction to really identifying guides if anyone's interested. Uh, it's also freely available so you can just google it. 
uh, for uh, rays similarly uh, i had to take the disc uh, width length and the disc length length and uh, apart from this i also identified whether the i text the um, individual so whether it was a male because of the presence of class bonds so i could also differentiate whether the uh, male is a immature maturing or mature individual because of the length and the uh, classification of the class bonds and females which had an and whether species individuals were gravid which means that they are pregnant with a pup or whether they are newborn so this is actually the umbilical scar of a shark and the rays have similar umbilical uh, uh, scars and this means that they are newly or newly born pups so the umbilical scars last for again uh, it depends on the species so it lasts from a few days to a few weeks depending on the species growth and the life history characteristics so what i found it was really really interesting um that from so i my study was carried out for a year and a half and we sampled around 5000 individuals representing 36 species of sharks and 21 species of rays and of the 36 shark species we were astonished to find that 12 were new records for the archipelago with new two new records for india and these were found within the first six months itself and of these not all were rare or contemporary records but both but most of them were very commonly caught and harvested and a few were also really commercially important shark species so while and this is really important because the big question arises that if we still don't know what species are found in the water how are we construct how are we making or you know even we have efficient management or policy systems in place uh by reviewing uh past literature we also found many misidentifications and misinformation about sharks and accurate species different shark species have very like history characteristics so starting from so these were the uh, two most uh, i am just checking whether it's uh, working uh, can you hear me yes yes we can hear you okay thank you so uh, so these were the few most common uh, shark species that i found in uh, andamans so the the slita so we often uh, you know think that if uh, we often think of sharks as being really big individuals but both these species the slita shark called because they got a slit behind the eye and the slender weasel shark uh, mostly because of the characteristic feature um, of it having like these three uh, lines is the characteristic feature for the shark uh but yeah i don't know why it's called a slender weasel shark but both these species are less than 1 meter in total length so the entire adult is only less than 1 meter but they have such interesting life history characteristics so this is a least concern species because it's very resilient and it also uh, breeds so we saw uh, that it breeded uh, we found gravid females which are pregnant females Uh, i think four times in a year which means that they have a really fast uh, reproductive strategy uh, whereas and that's why they are resilient to fishing pressures as well uh, and that's why they are least concerned whereas the same length approximately or the same length shark slender weasel shark is it shows similar landing pattern but uh, the report but breeding is in some areas is reported to be once every 2 years or so so this is a new threatened shark species and both of them have similar habitats and they are both caught similarly with in the fish in the same fishing gear but so but that will probably affect one species and not the other 
So which is why understanding these uh, aspects is also as important to develop efficient management plans. Similarly, silver tip shark. So um, this shark has like silver uh, white edges across its fins. Uh, this is a slow growing species growing up to a total length of three meters. Unlike the small size sharks, juveniles and neonates, which are which had umbilical scars, were mostly landed. On one occasion, we also recorded landings of almost 100 to 200 neonates, which meant that there's a, a, there's a nursery ground or a critical habitat close by. Similarly, scallop hammerhead also shows landing patterns. They are also, uh, they also grow up to like three meters and they show really interesting uh, patterns too. So they show diurnal and nocturnal variability in their movement, wherein during the day they are found closer to shore, whereas at night they hunt offshore. And adults are also found alone or in pairs. And in young juveniles, there'll always be one adult female. So even during the landings, we could find, because we sampled it over a year, we could find these individual differences of behavior of uh, even in like during the different seasons. So in some seasons, we did find landings of a lot of juveniles with one adult female shark. So that was also really important in like determining what sharks are found where and how they, are, how they use the entire space. Uh, we also had a lot of uh, rays, which were, so there's a giant guitar fish, which is one of the most critically endangered species currently. Um, the wedge fish, which, uh, and both the guitar fish and wedge fin have, their fins are, uh, uh, they have really thick fins. And when they dry the fins, uh, there's a lot of what they call needles, fin needles. Um, and that's why uh, their fins are in high demand. Uh, we also found mobula and manta species, which, uh, so mobula and manta, you can differentiate them because of their, where their mouths are present. So mobula or devil rays have their mouths on the ventral side, whereas mantas have their mouths on right in front. And they are fished because of their gills. So we could identify, uh, you know, the diversity, the seasonal aspects, the fishing your interactions. Like we uh, saw that the pelagic uh, longline fishery and the gillnet fishery, two types of fisheries, actually caught like from the smallest shark to the largest shark. Whereas a few other fisheries did not affect, uh, did not uh, only targeted like a, a small. Uh, uh, limited amount of like the uh, range of the total length. Uh, we also, so talking to fishers, we also identified the fishing grounds which overlapped with critical habitats and found, um, you know, whether there's a difference in like whether sharks and rays are actually, there's um, uh, the protected species got landed on them. And, but what does all of this mean is that there's a huge diversity so what's happening on mainland of India is that now you don't see any uh, large sharks and rays, but you, uh, sorry, large rays are found, but not large sharks. And that is because the fishing has been, uh, there's such an overexploitation of the fisheries that um, uh, even the, uh, the sharks do not, uh, the smaller shark species that are more desolate are mostly landed. And there's also a study that has uh, shown that fishing actually reduces the size, the total length of the species because it, uh, because fish do not take that much of energy then in like growing up to a large size. Uh, we also looked at the stakeholders. So stakeholders are any uh, individuals that have a stake in this fishery and we looked at their fisheries, the trade and looked at their perceptions because most of the, I mean, India has such a long coastline, so they are highly dependent on these fisheries. So we need to find solutions that were more holistic and not just a, you know, a blanket ban because that would not help anyone. So 
we did try to also have we did try to also engage the officials in um, uh, getting into this uh, in the monitoring and conservation efforts and uh, so what we see here is uh, actually them selling the dried meat so in the andaman islands we found unlike the mainland that uh, there was very little consumption because fishers really preferred uh, bony fish over cartilaginous fish but most of the sharks and rays are exported to either mainland india or international markets with the gill plates of the, these are the gill plates of morbillas and mantas and these are internationally traded um and while coastal fisheries you know get reduced and they're really impacted fishers have also moved to deeper areas and these are all deep sea sharks where their livers actually are two thirds the size of the body so they have an uh, so they are there's a targeted fishery for their liver for the liver oil uh, which is used for uh, boat varnish and like other in textile uh, and the deeper you go the more vulnerable the fish and sharks are so this is something to be really uh, careful about but what are the solutions so we definitely you know one solution will not help anything uh, and it's not just for sharks it's also for uh, it applies to like all the marine species too uh, so but we do still require species specific management because all species are so diverse and they use such different ranges they're caught in different gears so understanding all these efforts and having interventions at all these stages is so important uh and finally i uh, think we had a session of know your fish uh, so know your fish and in season are two seafood initiatives in india uh, consume, uh that uh, uh where uh, consumer preferences uh and to influence consumer preferences basically so they also do um uh, uh ask they do take into all uh, all these factors into account uh so as um i guess if you are starting off and are interested uh it's really important to read and to follow these uh, or to follow these seafood initiatives if you are a seafood lover uh, or even just go into the markets and observe the sharks and rays and participate in these outreach and uh, yeah other activities so thank you very much Thanks to you. So I guess um, when um, you, how the you started this session with the uh, Jaws film, uh, uh, you know, portrait, and uh, we actually know only the same thing as you said, those movies only. So uh, with comparing that. you know listening to today's session is completely uh, you know we they it took us in another level you know all these various species and uh, you know dead uh, sharks and rays uh, and uh, the fishery impact it's it's really a very uh, deep subject i guess but thanks for introduction so now thank you so much i really hope that uh, people are taking away more sorry there's a lag so i'm so sorry my internet is so unstable today no it's okay uh, then not much uh, you know affected that way we could hear you properly throughout the session so now if any questions uh, you can even write down in the chat box or you can ask directly by uh, unmuting yourself Uh, Tejal also put a feedback form in the chat box. Yeah. So any questions? No questions. No. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, okay, so what is the method of depicting if, sh- if rays are poisonous or not? So, um, so I would just like to uh, first add about a technical aspect. So the difference between like poisonous and venomous. So this also applies in terrestrial systems. So poisonous is something that is uh, ingested and harms us. Whereas venomous is something that is external. Yes, <laughs> sorry. So, um, so all stingrays have a little, they have the sting and they have a little venom in them. Um, but it's only, um, oh, it's only dangerous if it's, uh, if the stingray stings you on right near the heart or like near the head area. But otherwise, it's mostly, uh, it's not fatal. And also the stingray, so there are areas where, you know, the stingrays would rather avoid you and just flee rather than sting you. So, uh, yeah, there's no, I mean, most stingrays are uh, venomous, but if you look at, there are also non-venomous uh, rays like the giant guitarfish, the guitarfish, the wedgefish, um, uh, mobula and manta rays. Uh, even in mobulas, there is one species that has a spine, but a lot of other species, the spines have been, uh, I don't know whether I answered that question of yours. Uh, could you also share some NGOs we can participate in for marine conservation in India? So uh, there are several NGOs. Uh, so from uh, Dakshin, or Dakshin Foundation, Wildlife Trust of India, uh, but what, and there are also a lot of independent uh, researchers. Um, I would highly suggest that if anyone's interested, just get in touch with the scientist or the researcher. And we're always looking for volunteers and uh, yeah, enthusiasts really. So, uh, and just email them by observation is quite huge. So there's like marine mammals, fisheries, uh, different taxa or like even different environments. Uh, yeah. No problem. Guys, you can fill a feedback form meantime also because this is a very different subject we have taken today. So we would really like to know your feedback. Uh, there is one more question. Another question. Is there a strategy deployed in which the sharks are identified as soon as they are caught so that they can be returned to the water they are identified as an angel? So one of the most uh, difficult um, things even for me like I studied it for one uh, had to take uh, photographs of the sharks sometimes to identify them so it's not possible for fishers to identify them or even uh, you know it's not only fishers but even enforcement agencies and we often like I think uh, vil- vilify fishers because of that uh, that they're catching endangered species or, you know, they're, so we kind of made them the bad person. But it's, it's so much more complex than that. So you can't, it's very difficult to identify species. Um, also in my study area, what I found was that um, actually nobody knew. I mean, there was a lot of misinformation even about the laws and regulations. So there are species like... Um, the white spotted wedgefish, which is protected in the Wildlife Protection Act. Um, and this is a species that doesn't even exist in, in India. So it's not found in India at all. Um, also, there are similar looking species, uh, like there are different wedgefish species. Um, and there's just one, you know, one board put up with these 10 species listed in the Andamans. But so what has happened is um, fishers actually, uh, because wedge fish and guitar fish had the highest, uh, they, their fins were sold for like twice the amount for the other uh, species. 
uh, what happened is and the, because of this one image the fishers thought that all species of wedge fish and guitar fish are banned and this actually caused more of a damage because now there was a black market that formed rather than like a transparency and a trust that you know needed to be developed um and, but i do know that like there are few species that this works for like the whale shark for example because of its size you know its nature uh yeah they uh, and there are a lot of initiatives even the stockfish i think are a little too late to like um protect or conserve the stockfish now but the guitar fish and wedge fish are definitely areas where we are kind of focusing attention to uh yeah conserve these species uh so Why it is they, late for software uh so they have already gone uh, locally extinct in a lot of areas okay. and uh, even in uh, areas where they are found uh, sorry where uh, like there is only like one or two uh, records that have been found so there are initiatives like in maharashtra they started a really nice initiative is where they compensate for the damage nets to the fishers when they are caught so we uh, we kind of need a holistic approach to these just because of the nature not only of the fishery but also like the diversity of sharks and whales we kind of need to have a, a holistic approach of like identifying Uh, critical habitats because what's happening is that like some species also aggregate you know they have the entire nursery area so fishers just with their nets they just scoop up that entire area so the entire population goes so if we can like identify these areas and conserve them or like uh, reduce targeted fishing you know like there are some uh fishers that are like their entire livelihoods are dependent because of i mean on like certain species so like try to engage them in a uh, kind of um, having an alternate livelihood option so there are yeah several uh, uh several strategies that we could actually employ uh but is your said that done also the camps in india um like there are a couple of um uh, uh endangered species that are endemic sorry i completely forgot the word endemic but uh, endemic to uh, for example in uh, south africa there is a species called pajama sharks that are endangered and so in the uh, they are uh, breeded under artificial uh, uh, in artificial environments uh, in india um, i don't think this has been done just because uh, of the you know, you know the nature or like i mean we still don't know what species are even found in our waters so we require a whole lot of work to even just determine what species are um, Uh, what species are endangered or what's not so yeah and i think that's where we should really need to like start need more people can sharks be breeded someone has asked yes so uh, so that's the uh, so that's the one i uh, answered right now so like in uh, south africa and i mean globally i know that they have been breeded but uh, in india it's uh, uh, i think like bre- uh, from a conserve sorry i'm just thinking from a conservation angle breeding is to kind of uh, conserve the population right so and in india i think we need a uh, much more uh, unfortunately fisheries management approach uh, rather than like a breeding thing because we still don't know what species are even found in india to like uh, you know or even uh, even and apart from that even the facilities but there are a few species that are quite resilient like the bamboo sharks and the no shark so they yeah, are the bamboo sharks um so they are more resilient so uh, they Uh, i don't know about breeding but sorry coming back to the question of 
uh, you know, is there a strategy deployed in which the sharks are identified and they can be returned to the water? So they are trying this with bamboo sharks because uh, one of the things, so if you catch a hammerhead shark, for example, hammerheads are more, uh, they are more prone to stress rather than so if you return them there oh, it's not a guarantee that they will survive so but on the other hand bamboo sharks are more resilient and oh, which is why you can return them to the water so that's also like yeah a lot of differences in the diverse knowing the diversity and the life history characteristics and just things like oh, yeah all these other factors uh, can you please throw some light on how marine biologists are trained underwater to deal and study sharks? As we saw one of your pictures, what are the difficulties you're often faced as a marine biologist? Um, so, uh, okay, I don't know what photo you're talking about, but I actually, uh, I started studying the coral reef. I was helping another researcher study the, um, res the coral reef resilience in the Andaman and Nicobar. And that's where um, yeah, I was very fortunate to have like dived and really been underwater. But I, that's why when I started my study for sharks and rays, because I, it's exactly what I realized that, you know, we are talking about resilience and like saving coral reefs. And we are talking about how sharks and rays have, they play such an important and integral part to the ecosystem. And, but we didn't like, um, I was doing, I worked with that project for I think three years now. And we did not see a single shark, live shark in the waters. And that was just so surprising because uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's exactly that, right? Like that we textbook theory was just so different than what we were seeing in reality. And I also uh, I asked somebody else who had studied uh, sh uh, sharks and they just asked me to talk to people and uh, I, a, lo a lot of the local communities uh, who are also fishers, they said that they had seen a steep decline in shark fisheries. And then I went to the landing fish landing site. And over there, I was just mind blown because uh, we got, like we, we recorded a diversity of 36 species of sharks and 21 species of rays. And that's a huge diversity because in other parts, you're only hardly finding like 20 species of sharks and rays combined. And we found such a diversity, I think also because of the habitats that, you know, uh, Andamans harbors. But, uh, and yeah, so uh, it was just a lot to learn, I think, even with that. Um, what are the difficulties I face as a marine biologist? Uh, so, uh, sorry, so just um, shedding light on the training underwater and studying sharks. So the thing is, I think um, that's why these initiatives like the Sarvasas Biodiversity Cell are so important because um, I was not, I mean, you don't really learn all of this, you know, in uh, like there are a few organizations, which uh, wildlife organizations in India, which are uh, which introduced you to these aspects. But um, I was not, so uh, I really learned it by volunteering. Uh, so I uh, volunteered with like on the coral reef project. I volunteered with uh, people who were studying marine mammals and kind of learned both sides of the equation, like from the species specific and also like the other part of like the social economics. So I think it's, uh, it's mostly yeah, just uh, kind of keeping, you know, uh, take, grabbing every opportunity you need, networking and like just seeing what's there. Um, and uh, studying sharks. So abroad, there are several ways to studying sharks. So you can tag them and there are different types of tagging tools. So you can study the movement and habitat patterns. There are like genetics, molecular biology. Um, I chose this method because it was the easiest to get a whole lot of information. It was also the cheapest way because you're spending so much on one tag and if it's fished, then <laughs> your entire project just goes. Um, I did find it a bit difficult to work at the fish landing site, but uh, because as a woman, a lot of people told me that, you know, I won't be able to 
uh, go to the, I mean, uh, uh, the fishers won't give me information or I won't be able to do this job. Um, I'm very happy to say that actually the fishers were, uh, some of, most of them were amazing and they were very helpful. Um, and of course, so it's, yeah, it's, I guess, just um, working hard and being on your path and finding people who kind of encourage you. So Zoya, uh, one thing you mentioned uh, just answering a question that uh, due to the stress, uh, hammerhead shark, even if it's left back, it won't survive or many mm -hmm. chances are less. Uh, this is really a very interesting, uh, you know, thought or subject. Has anyone studied on their psychology? Uh, so of psychology of sharks uh -huh. Means, yeah, uh, so, th so there are uh, a lot of behavior uh, it's not in india but uh, globally there are uh, a lot of behavior um, studies done um, yeah and also like the stress part so they have uh, so when you catch a shark uh, they they do have they take the blood levels i think and they determine the stress Oh, I forgot, sorry, I forgot what it's called and I'm not a molecular biologist, but they do have the uh, test for like the hormones, the stress hormones for that. So that's how they could determine different things. Um, psychology and the behavior is really difficult because it requires like a control, it requires an experimental setup. And that is kind of, uh, I would say a bit, uh, really, really difficult in India because you have so many different factors. It's like fishing, climate change, habitat destruction. Um, I know that they have done, like there are, um, if you check out the Bimini Shark Lab, I think in Florida. So what they have done is they have, there they have uh, full protection, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, full protection of sharks over there and they have actually set up like a maze and like experimental setups where they look at the behaviors of you no know, sharks and other species. Um, yeah. So I guess if any other question, we can take one or two, otherwise we can end the session. Any questions? If anyone want to ask, you can ask. Zoya, uh, Chetna Purushottam had come on our uh, platform and uh, one of the students had asked her her favorite movie that time. And uh, <laughs> she told uh, my octopus teacher and I was completely blown by that movie. So yeah. can you tell us uh, if anything <laughs> <laughs> we can have a look for you know mm -hmm. shark and not similar pattern but anything interesting on uh, mm -hmm. your study that kind of movie if you can watch oh uh, yeah i can't i can't think of anything so i know there are a, quite a few documentaries like oh master's teacher was incredible i also really loved it but i know there is a documentary called sea spiracy but on uh, overfishing uh, but um, I would also say, but there has been a lot of um, cons for the movie too. So I would also suggest like watching it, but then reading, you know, all the other reviews about it too. Yeah, I wanted to actually uh, highlight one other really interesting fact that, um, I mean, it just kind of blew my mind away. So, uh, in, again, this is a case study in South Africa. So, you know, we think of great white sharks, which is, uh, it's a species in jaws too, like jaws was a great white shark, um, as apex predators and like these, you know, deathly animals. Uh, in South Africa, there was a very interesting case. Uh, what happened is they saw two orcas or killer whales. So these are, uh, yeah, um, I hope everyone knows what killer whales are. So they are the they are the cetacean species. So they are in the same family of dolphins and whales. And uh, there was a pod there, and two uh, and dolphins and whales show uh, a lot of like personality. 
and there were two individuals who went away from the pond uh, and they had uh, uh, they had uh, their dorsal fin was bent which means that the animal is stressed otherwise it's free um, so and they found at the same time when they were sighting these two individuals they found that uh, there were a lot of great white sharks that were stranded and the great white sharks like the first great white sharks that they did the necropsy on they found that the bite was quite big and uh, the liver was missing but as the landings uh, the stranding sorry uh, increased there was like slight incisions with the livers missing and they realized that these two we uh, orcas or um, Uh, these two uh, killer whales were actually targeting great white sharks for their livers, and they also found this uh, to affect. So uh, some of the great white sharks had been tagged, and as soon as they saw them, they saw that the great white sharks had just vanished from the area. And how this affected the entire system was. Uh, this led to like the increase of other apex predator uh, other apex predators that like sharks that were found in that system that were otherwise not coming out uh, there was also a population change in the number of seals which are the prey species the uh, economy or the economy dependent of south africa also dependent on uh, the white shark tourism so it also affected that so it just shows you how important like long term monitoring is and yeah and it was just an incredible thing because like the entire system changes you know so we learn about like such specific things in like textbook but we don't realize like you know how much it can actually change yeah thanks doya thanks for uh, all your experiences in this wonderful session so i think we can come to the end of the session if any question you have you can connect with zoya on instagram also uh, nishta you can go ahead with the vote of thanks and uh, uh, i request everyone to open their videos for a quick uh, a group screenshot uh, so if you can open your videos when nishta is giving uh, her vote of thanks that would be really great yes nishta you can go ahead thank you ma'am Well, what an informative webinar! I had no idea about the huge diversity of sharks and how important they are for the ecosystem. I am confident our dear audience learned something new today. It is rightly said, a good event never ends; it only takes a pause and keeps us waiting for the next. It's my honor to propose a vote of thanks today. I, on behalf of the Symbiosis Biodiversity Team. First of all, extend my most sincere thanks to our guest speaker Zoya Ma'am for taking out vital time from a busy schedule and for sharing her knowledge and spreading the awareness. Thank you, Ma'am. Further, a big thanks to the participants for such a lovely audience and to making this webinar a success. With their appreciating ideas, I also mention my sincere sense of gratitude to our biodiversity cell. and would like to place my hearty thanks to all the volunteers kunal chandak tejal rajput and myself for helping in to make this meet a success i also want to thank shilpa ma'am for making all of this possible and also for her consistent guidance and help thank you ma'am i once again thank you all for the participation have a great day ahead thanks nishta thanks tejal thanks kunal zoya uh thank you very much for your time once again and oh, thank you we'll so see much. you see we'll see you again some day yes thank you so much yeah bye 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 so guys guys i have